love running. I love running. It's becoming more and more accepted that just having flat feet is not necessarily a predictor that your feet are going to have a problem. Uh, it's not necessarily a predictor of other joint problems throughout your body like we've thought in the past. Um, however, there are certain flat feet that hurt. The kind of flat foot that I'm most concerned about is fairly rare, and it's called acquired flat foot, and it typically happens in a fifth decade female who is generally a little bit overweight, has worn some very bad shoes, and what will happen is the tendon that comes in under the ankle called the tibialis posterior tendon that is responsible for lifting the arch and supinating the arch will literally stretch or tear or completely rupture. That person's arch literally will collapse and that's the worst kind of pathologic flat foot. The other kind of flat foot that occurs, occurs naturally. Certain genetic populations have feet that are more flat than others. Some of the best long distance runners in the world, as a matter of fact, the world record holder for the marathon, has some of the flattest feet I've ever seen. This part of his arch literally touches the ground, but he can run two hours and five minutes for, for marathon. So these days, most of us who treat athletes are not as concerned as we used to be about the height of the arch. We're more concerned about the function of the foot. Uh, in fact, a lot of parents will bring their children in with feet that look a little bit flat and they're concerned that their child won't develop naturally. What we do want to make sure that we do is not to encourage any more flattening of the foot than what nature had in mind for that foot. The height of the arch, as we mentioned, is no longer thought to be the predictor of disability. If we are concerned, though, what we want to do is we want to maximize the muscular control of the foot. And the best way that I've discovered to do that is to make very good use of the flexor hallucis longus tendon. Uh, that muscle is a muscle that's not very well known to most adult Americans. It's, it's behind the tibia bone, um, more laterally. It crosses the back of the leg and it wraps around the inside part of the ankle. And it goes under this shelf of bone on the heel bone. And after it crosses under the heel bone, it goes out to the very last toe bone the distal phalanx of the great toe. In its ideal state, will lift that shelf, but it can only do that if the big toe is over here where nature designed us to be. So we're all born with the capacity to do this, but by about age two or three, the footwear for kids is starting to push the toe over, which when the toe starts to move over towards the second toe, flexor hallucis longus starts to become slack and will no longer appropriately lift under that shelf of bone and it will begin to encourage that arch to get flatter. Couple that with this another feature that we put in footwear called toe spring which takes the end of the big toe where the attachment point is and pulls it over literally encourages and forces the foot to undergo this flattening. What we want to make sure and do is address how the footwear creates flattening of the foot. When we elevate the heels of footwear, the science is very clear that that shortens the lower leg muscles on the back. And the reason why that's important is the two outer lower leg muscles, the gastrocnemius and the soleus, attach right here through the Achilles tendon. Every podiatric textbook that I've ever read is very clear that when those muscle groups become tight, it tries to force the calcaneus bone to do this which is causing a flattening of the arch. If you have an elevated heel on your footwear, that's gonna cause the arch to be flatter than it would be. If you have toe spring on your footwear, that's also encouraging the arch to flatten. And then probably the most significant piece is the tapering of the toe box. My training is to identify a flat foot and to make a custom orthotic to bring that joint back up to neutral. And I did that for 10 years with limited success. What I do now, which works much more effectively, is to not artificially force something up under a part of the foot that was never intended to be lifted. What I encourage people to do these days is to get footwear that lets their arch, no matter what height it is, function in its best integrity. And that is level from the heel all the way out to the ends of the toes, so no heel elevation, no toe spring. Most importantly, we want that foot to be naturally positioned all the way out to the ends of the toes. Remember, that's the attachment point of those very important lower leg muscles. So when we get a foot to function this way, the arch is built to maintain itself. As soon as we begin squeezing 
lifting and shortening, we're gonna encourage that foot to flatten out more than it is intended to. So rather than using an orthotic device or a footbed or an orthotic back here, we literally use the foot's natural suspension system. It's built in. And to use your own foot's natural suspension system, you need to be very aware of how your footwear for most of your athletic activities is gonna take away from that. I love running, I love running. I love running, I love running.